Hello everybody, this is Philip Jonas at Kalamazoo Valley Community College presenting OpenStax Principles of Economics. And today we're covering section 19.1, measuring the size of the economy, gross domestic product. In this module, you will learn to evaluate how economists measure gross domestic product or GDP for short. Identify the components of GDP on the demand side and on the supply side and contrast and calculate GDP, net exports and net national product. This marks our first module in macroeconomics. So let me give you a brief overview on what we're going to be talking about in this and future modules. Macroeconomics deals with our entire economy as a system. And we have some primary policy goals here. We are looking for an economy that ideally experiences economic growth while doing so with low inflation and low unemployment. Eventually, we are going to be discussing this in a framework of the model of aggregate demand and aggregate supply and how it can be used to represent both a more Keynesian or neoclassical perspective. Finally, we're going to discuss how our primary policy tools of monetary policy and fiscal policy help us achieve these goals. But for now, we have to get started by learning about the data that describes a macroeconomy to begin with. And for that, we're starting with our flagship measure, gross domestic product. As we encounter our various macroeconomic data series, I also want you to be a little bit familiar with major institutions that produce this data for us. For starters, we've got the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or BEA for short, that produce our nation's economic accounts. A particular subsection of those economic accounts we'll focus on today are the National Income or Pro and Product Accounts, or NEPA for short. GDP is part of NEPA. Later, we are going to be discussing data produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS for short. This institute, among other things, produces data on inflation and employment. And while these are the primary sources of the data, quite often when you see a graph, you'll see that it's prepared by FRED, which stands for Federal Reserve Economic Data, a super useful database and website maintained by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. If you are looking for an economic time series, I would go to fred.stlouisfed.org and look there first. So let's go ahead and start discussing gross domestic product. The idea is that we want one number that describes all the goods and services produced within our country's borders in the span of one year. Now, while this is the flagship measure of economic activity, it does have a number of closely related measures. For example, if we switch the D for an N in GDP, we get gross national product. Very similar idea, we are measuring one year worth of production, but instead of location, we're now focusing on ownership. What did the residents of our country produce? Or to give another example, we can switch from gross domestic and national product to net domestic and national product. In this case, we are subtracting the effects of depreciation, that is to say, the consumption of fixed capital. And even the final letter, P, can come in a second variety. Because, big picture, if you're trying to measure everything a country produces in the span of a year, you can use one of three primary approaches. And every country's statistical agencies have to decide for themselves where they think 
they have the greatest confidence in produ producing accurate and timely numbers. In other words, while in theory all three approaches should produce the same number, in practice this is a huge undertaking and we see discrepancies between these three approaches. So then you have to decide which number is your preferred and official one and which numbers do you say we attribute the statistical discrepancy to and say that they are a little bit less accurate. So in the case of the United States, our primary measure of GDP is based on the so-called expenditure approach, where we measure our nation's production based on the spending on that output. That's our bar here all the way on the left. We've got personal consumption expenditures, private investment, inventories, government expenditures, and net exports. We'll dive into each of these in just a little bit. A second approach would be to add up all the incomes in an economy, such as employee compensation and the operating surpluses of firms. Since this isn't our primary measure, we instead refer to it as GDI, gross domestic income. And finally, a third approach would be a value-added approach, where at each stage of production, we are looking at the difference between the gross output and the intermediate purchases necessary to produce it. Again, the same number should come out, but in reality, there is measurement error. So again, our primary measure for GDP is the expenditure approach. But we do want to be able to understand how we can convert between that and alternate measures, such as, for example, net domestic product. So let's have a look at a really big chart here. Here is the entire setup of conversions we might be looking at, which looks really intimidating at first, but there's actually a sensible pattern to this chart. So we start all the way on the left with gross domestic product, our flagship measure. And now we flip one letter in GDP depending on what type of adjustment we're making. If we are going from expenditure to income approach, from GDP to GDI, the difference is going to be the statistical discrepancy because to the extent that they are different, we say GDP is our official measure, GDI is different. Option number two, if we replace the D with an N in the middle, we are converting from gross domestic to gross national product. So here we're subtracting net income payments to the rest of the world. We'll look at that in a table in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Finally, if we are replacing the leading G in GDP with an N, we're converting from gross domestic to net domestic product, which means we are subtracting the consumption of fixed capital, also referred to as depreciation. And from then on, we can continue to make the other adjustments. For example, GDP minus statistical discrepancy gets you to GDI and once again subtracting the consumption of fixed capital will then get you to NDI. If you make all three subtractions, statistical discrepancy, net income payments to the rest of the world and consumption of fixed capital, the final measure you can arrive at is referred to as national income or NI. Let's go ahead now and have a closer look at the expenditure approach of GDP. As I already mentioned, we are looking at GDP in a number of major spending categories here. And 
as we do math using these categories in future modules, we also have standard algebra symbols that we substitute in when doing math. These are C for consumption, I for investment, G for government, and finally NX for net exports. Now that last one, net exports, is a little bit special. Net means we are looking at the difference between two numbers. So number one, it's the only one out of these four categories that might be a negative number. And secondly, you might also encounter it broken out into its components. Net exports is calculated as the difference between exports and imports, in which case it'll show up as X minus M instead. All of these expenditure categories put together give us what's often referred to as the National Income Accounting Identity, where we use our algebra symbol for GDP, which is the capital letter Y. Funny story, we're not entirely sure why it is the letter Y. Some people think it's because in a mathematical function, Y is often a letter for output. Others think it's because Y is phonetically close to income and the I is already taken for investment. But that's how it sometimes goes in science and we don't quite know anymore why we're doing something. Anyway, back to that income accounting identity. You will encounter it in the form of an equation where GDP or the capital letter Y is either equal to C plus I plus G plus NX or the NX here being replaced with X minus M. The parentheses, of course, just for convenience here, they don't actually change the order of operations in any way that would have an impact. So let me tell you what real world measurements are going into each of these letters. So starting at the beginning with the C for consumption. The technical category here is referred to as personal consumption expenditures. And the rule of thumb is, these are all the goods and services in our economy that are either purchased by households or purchased by certain other private entities for households. So for example, if a nonprofit helps out a household with something. When we look in greater detail at personal consumption expenditures, we will further see it broken down into goods and services. The distinction here is that a good is any product that can be stored or inventoried. So for example, even personal software would count as a good, not a service. And we might further subdivide into durable versus non-durable goods. Durable here meaning that the expected average useful life is going to be at least three years. So for example, a car would be a great example of a durable good. Services, on the other hand, cannot be stored or inventoried. Like for example, your cell phone plan would count as a service in this accounting. That's the big C. Let's go ahead and proceed to the big I. Technical term, gross private domestic investment. So there's a lot going on here. Number one, major category, we have fixed assets that private businesses are buying like a factory, for example, or a machine. Now, within this, we are also distinguishing between non-residential and residential investment. The factory would be non-residential, an apartment complex would be residential. There's one thing you have to look out for here. Often you can get the impression that gross private domestic investment purchases are always being made by businesses. That's not all the way true because all residential fixed investment 
goes into the I category. So if a household buys a house, that's new construction. So it would count for GDP because it was actually built that year. That also goes into I. Next, let's go ahead and talk about net exports of goods and services. Pretty straightforward idea here. We're trying to measure everything produced by our country. But not everything produced by our country is sold here. If it's sold to a foreign resident, we are looking at an export and we have to add that to our GDP measure. Vice versa. In consumption, investment or government, we end up with purchases that weren't made in our country. So we have to subtract those back out, since obviously they shouldn't be counting for our own GDP. And that gets us to our final category, government consumption expenditures and investment. So in other words, everything the government does, whether we might consider it consumption or investment, goes into its own category G. And when we say government here, we don't just mean the federal government. An even bigger category are expenditures by state and local government entities. So now that we have encountered all four categories, let's see how these are reported by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Here is your first look at a table from the National Income and Product Accounts, or NEPA for short. There's a lot going on here, so let's orient ourselves a little bit. First of all, you'll notice, hey, this table has a three-digit code. There's a system to this, because the National Income and Product Accounts have a whole bunch of tables in them. Also notice, that the numbers in this table are in billions of dollars. So for example, when you see this first number here, about 24,000, that's 24,000 billion dollars or 24 trillion dollars. It's macroeconomics, get used to your millions, billions and trillions. The numbers that we are looking at are presented seasonally adjusted at annual rates. Seasonally adjusted refers to a statistical adjustment procedure that we are not going to be covering. But basically what we are looking at is that our economy over the course of a year goes through predictable cycles. For example, towards the end of the year, a whole bunch of purchases of presents tend to be made. And we don't want these predictable fluctuations to conceal the underlying trends in our economy. So quite often it's best to look at these numbers after the seasonal components have been removed. Of course, there are other tables that present the same numbers without the seasonable, seasonal adjustment. Secondly, Annual rates. That's much simpler than it sounds. So we see some columns here that have a year number, like 2021, 2022. Those are numbers representing an entire year of economic activity, January 1st through December 31st. But then we also have the numbers with the Qs, so-called quarterly numbers. So for example, first quarter, January, February, March, second quarter, April, May, June, and so on and so forth. To make it easier to compare between numbers that are annual and numbers that are computed based on three months at a time, quarterly numbers, we convert the quarterly numbers to annual rates, which is as simple as multiplying by four, because there are four quarters in a year, if the numbers are already seasonally adjusted, because that means the seasonal impact has already been removed. 
Next, you will notice that in a NEPA table, you will always see when these numbers were produced. So for example, these numbers we're looking at right now came out in October. That means if we are looking at the third quarter numbers here, those third quarter numbers, July, August, September, those third quarter numbers for the first time are produced in October. So there's sort of one month lag. It's for the previous three months. The first time they are produced, we refer to them as the advance release because that's the fastest the Bureau of Economic Analysis can produce a timely and accurate number. But there are additional measures for that quarter that will come in later and produce even more accurate numbers. So in the following two months, November and December, the Bureau of Economic Analysis will then produce numbers for this third quarter here, referred to as the second and third release. These incorporate more data and will be better, more accurate, but you have to wait for them longer. And then come January, we get our advance release for the fourth quarter. February gets us the second release. March gets us the third release. So we always have three months, one quarter, three releases, and then we proceed to the next quarter. Okay, so that's the setup of how these numbers are produced. And then they show up in some very nice standard predictable tables for us. And not only do the tables themselves have a standard numbering scheme, so 115, for example, is always gross domestic product, seasonally adjusted at annual rates based on the expenditure categories here. Each row on this table also has a standard number so that it's easier for us to communicate with each other. If I say, hey, table 115, row 7, that's predictably going to be gross private domestic investment. So right at the top of the table, we have the total number gross domestic product, what we are learning about in this module. All our country's production in the span of a year. And under our flagship expenditure approach, this is then broken down into the categories C, I, NX, and G. Each of them here in boldface. Finally, within these categories, we have some more detailed subcategories. For our personal consumption expenditures, for example, we've got the goods and the services, and the goods further subdivided into durable and non-durable. Notice how, as we are going into further levels of detail, the indentation increases. Again, for our business investment here, we've got our non-residential and residential, and also our inventories. Gotta keep track of the production that hasn't been sold yet somewhere, right? So into gross private domestic investment it goes. But then we can get more and more detailed. For example, what about intellectual property products that were developed, like a new piece of business software? These are the GDP numbers in dollar terms. They give us hopefully and in more intuitive way of characterizing just how much we produced. Because our economy produces a wide variety of products. And if you want to summarize that using one number, a very sensible approach is to use the money that was spent on this production. So for example, you could say, in the year 2022, the US economy produced $25.7 trillion worth 
of goods and services. Notice net exports a negative number. I'll get back to that in a minute. But instead of just looking at it in terms of dollars, it can also be super useful to look at these numbers as a percentage of the total. So here's table 1110, where out of 100% of total GDP, we are asking how much of that is accounted for by each category. And you will notice, by far, the largest category of GDP are personal consumption expenditures. Goods and services bought by households or for households by private institutions. Basically, things that make our life nicer. And that is completely standard for an advanced economy. In fact, you could go so far as to say that's kind of the point of an economy to produce a good standard of living for the people in that economy. So this is the original presentation of the data in a NEPA table. Let's now have a look at these numbers graphed over time from the Federal Reserve economic data. Notice the FRED acronym up here. So what we're looking at here is for the 21st century, how do personal consumption expenditures C compare to investment I and government G? Again, consumption by far the largest share. Well, what's also super convenient about FRED is that in these graphs, we have gray bars. These indicate time periods where the US economy was in a recession or contraction. We are going to cover in a future module what exactly that means, but you've probably heard the term recession before, and for now just think of it as a slowdown in economic activity. Basically, bad times. Now look how these expenditure categories behave during the recessions of the 21st century. Consumption expenditures actually tend to be fairly stable as a share of GDP. But something we'll be talking about in future modules is that during recessions, gross private domestic investment, the green line over here, during recessions, investment spending tends to fall. You can see that particularly dramatically here in the financial crisis 2008-2009 because that financial crisis of course was centered on the housing market and housing as a structure is in the investment category. As we discuss our policy tools, we are then also going to talk about the idea that we can try to make recessions less severe by having government spending go a little bit in the opposite direction and go up during a recession. So again, notice 2008-2009, investment down, government spending up. Not as much up, there was still a recession. Or here, we've got, of course, what's going to ruin some of my charts for the rest of my teaching career, the COVID-related lockdowns, very brief but quite severe. Notice investment dipping down, government spending going up. So this is gross domestic product if we are looking at, if you will, the domestic categories. Let's put exports and imports on more or less the same picture. So I've still got personal consumption expenditures up here as a share of GDP, sort of as a reference so that the sense of scale is similar. And now notice how exports in red and imports in green behave. With our 21st century recessions here, we always see trade dipping down as a percentage of GDP 
and both of them moving in the same direction, rather than government spending and investment, which might move in opposite directions. These are the expenditure components of GDP, but another perspective on GDP would be, well, rather than focusing on the purpose for which these products are purchased, let's look at the type of products our economy produces. Table 125. So the three major subcategories we recognize here are goods, again, can be stored, can be inventoried, that's what we're looking for. Services, cannot be stored or inventoried. And finally, structures, so both residential and non-residential. Having shown you the table, let's go straight to the Fred graph. And what do we notice? By far the largest product category in our economy are services. Like all advanced economies, we are primarily service-based. And here we can start to see a little bit of a difference between the three recessions we've had so far in the 21st century. During the very mild 2001 recession and even the big financial crisis, services stayed strong as a product type in our economy. But there's the COVID lockdown, right? Of course, if you can't go many places, services will take a significant dip. Goods production, on the other hand, always experiences a dip in these recessions. Yes, even in 2001, again, that very mild recession, so you don't see a lot going on. And then finally, of course, when we look at structures, smallest product type of our GDP, we see that there was a particularly severe impact during the financial crisis, an impact that persisted even after the recession was over. In fact, many economists argue quite credibly that we still haven't fully recovered in terms of how many structures our economy produces, which perhaps is even contributing to housing affordability problems. All right, so those were our major product categories. Let me finish up discussing this NEPA table by making some accounting notes, because in a very real sense, this is an accounting exercise. We are trying to catalog everything our country produces. But what about used goods? Those are sales, right? Those are expenditures. But they aren't necessarily production. They were already there. So how do we treat those sales? Well, we incorporate them on a net basis. So basically, if I sell a car to you, household to household, we are going to treat that as you spent money, I received money, that cancels out. Or, in terms of the overall perspective, the car was already there, it wasn't produced. We do it a little different if you buy that car from, for example, a car dealership or a government entity. Here, we are calculating the net by excluding the cost of goods. So what's that mean? Well, let's say I sell my car for $5,000 to the used car dealership, and then you buy it for $6,000. We net those two out, and we say the difference, $1,000, that's the amount of service that the dealership produced in this transaction, whether you're talking about assessing the quality of the vehicle, maybe refurbishing it a little bit, producing a match between the buyer and the seller. Again, we're looking at that in terms of the value added, if you will. 
Next, let's have a closer look at imports. In our national income accounting identity, imports show up as a subtraction all the way at the end. This can lead you with the impression that imports are somehow making the GDP number smaller. It's not quite like that. What's actually going on is that the imports are also showing up in our purchases in the country, be they in C, I, or G. Like, let's say I buy a shirt and it's a $20 shirt. That's purchase for personal consumption expenditure shows up in C plus $20. But let's say that shirt was an import, it wasn't made here. Then we're going to also log it in M as minus $20. And now it shows up in two places, C and M, that cancel each other out. Speaking of cancellations, we have so-called intermediate goods. So goods that aren't yet for the final consumer. Under our flagship measure for gross domestic product, the expenditure approach, we typically don't want to count those because if we did, we'd be counting them many times. Like imagine you've got a tire company making a tire, selling this tire to a car company, car company puts the tire on the car, and then the car company sells the car to the consumer. That final sale includes the tire. So we don't want to count the tire when it goes from tire company to car company as well, because then we'd be counting it twice. And in fact, if you look at a modern supply chain, which can be quite long, we might be counting some products 20 times same production if we were counting intermediate goods. Not good. The only exception here is, of course, if we've got an export or import. Our tire company makes a tire, sells the tire to a car company in a different country. Well, that eventual car sale is not going to be logged for US GDP. So we do count that tire when it gets exported, because from our perspective, we're kind of done with it at this point, even though it was an intermediate good. Likewise, if we produce something using imported components, those imported components get subtracted back out when we're talking about how much of the production took place in our country. And finally, a particularly exciting category, the illegal goods and services that every economy produces. Those don't show up in GDP. Not because we don't want them to, if we had the numbers, oh man, we'd absolutely want to put that into GDP. But for obvious reasons, it is really quite difficult to get reliable numbers on illegal activities. So unfortunately, for now, those don't show up in our income and product accounts. So with these accounting notes out of the way, Let's look at one more nice table here, 1.7.5, where we are also seeing the relationship of the various companion measures to GDP we discussed earlier. So going through one version of this set of additions and subtractions one more time, let's start with our flagship measure gross domestic product. If we want to go from gross domestic product to gross national product, we have to subtract net income payments to the rest of the world. So what we're doing is we are subtracting what we are paying to, for example, foreign residents, but we are adding or subtracting as a negative number, same thing, what, for example, an American resident might be earning abroad. So that's how we go from domestic to national. You can see in the scope of national income accounting, $200 billion difference, it's actually not that huge of a difference. 
Now let's go from gross to net. So we have to get rid of the consumption of fixed capital. That's going to be a much bigger number because capital loses value over time. We have that broken down a little bit into subcategories. Is it business capital? Is it household capital? Is it government capital? But by the time all is said and done, over $4 trillion of value disappears. And then finally, there is that question of how do we count? Our preferred measure is the expenditure approach. So that's what we call the product version. But one could argue that we could also count by adding up all income sources in our economy. But that's not our official measure. So to whatever extent they are different, again, theoretically, those should be the same, but turns out it's a hard problem. So you count them up, they might be different by tens, even hundreds of billions of dollars. We're going to say that's a statistical discrepancy. So we're going to subtract that out. Meaning the way we define this, should gross domestic income be a bigger number than gross domestic product, we are expressing the statistical discrepancy as a negative number because it is being subtracted and subtracting a negative number gives you an addition. Finally, there's another chain of adjustments we could make here that we will not talk about, which would get us to a measure called personal income. And that concludes our first look at gross domestic product. In this module, you learned how economists measure gross domestic product, how to identify the components of GDP on the demand side and the supply side, and how to contrast and calculate GDP, net exports, and net national product. I will see you next time.